Hey everybody, Austin here. Hey, so I can't get the um, I can't get my uh, little screen picture here to show my face, but I guess that's not important. I just think it's normally more personable. But anyway, I got another trade recap I want to go over. Um, this one it's on SES. But before I do, I want to say I'm not licensed, I'm not registered, and none of this shall be taken as investment advice, even if it sounds like it. All right, so I had a trade on SES today, and um, this was uh, what we like to call a black swan runner. Uh, basically, a black swan is something that happens, you know, once in every blue moon, right? The black swan is super rare to find. It's, it's one, it's a, it's a play that comes around that normally catches every single person off guard. Now, like, at, you know, like what, what we try to do in the chat is we try to kind of guess when things have been kind of stagnant for a very long time. That's typically when you'll see a black swan runner appear. When everyone is just not expecting anything, it just it, the market's been totally dead, and we'll finally get one. And that's the case this time. It doesn't have to be a dead market for a black swan runner to come, but very often that's when they like to come. And we call this a black swan runner because it went from three yesterday, right? Or like I guess it gapped up on the on the day one of the move. Uh, you know, we gapped up to three and pushed to five, and the next day, you know, we open at ten and go all the way up here to 26, right? That's what we call a black swan, just something that completely just defies all reasonable expectations of, of stock behavior. So let's get into it. So, I mean, I guess we can start from day one because this, kind of this is kind of when the move starts, right? So this stock on day one, I actually had a nice trade on this I had a nice trade on this on day one too. I got a nice short up here, the first resistance um, short up here on pre-market highs when we pushed up here and I covered down here. But this this place started when the stock gapped up, right? And it gapped up on, you know what? I don't even, the stock gapped up on news and and the news was, I'm checking it out right here. Yeah, that's right. The, the, yeah, they agree to acquire Australian Future Energy for thirty-six billion. Right? It's just a it's a simple catalyst. It's a good catalyst. It's a it's a hype catalyst because it's a lot of money for a small company. So it's a, it's a big deal. So it's like it's material. It's a material catalyst. It's not something like oh, here are insignificant drug reports. Right? So it's it's something significant, but. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to turn into a black swan. There's a, there's a lot of catalysts that show up that kind of create a that that don't create a black swan. What really creates a black swan is sentiment, right? The market has to be ready for one or not ready for one, meaning that traders kind of have to un, you know not be expecting trends to continue, not be expecting stocks to you know like traders get comfortable with stocks fading and that becomes a little too anticipated you know, or two guests and when short sellers get caught and the volume is high enough on a low float, like this one was like a one million share float, what can happen is just the, the float rotates over and over and over and over and over again and at, at some point it comes to the point to where it doesn't even matter how high the stock is because the float has been rotated so many times that it, there's not just this enormous amount of demand or selling pressure from people who bought the bottom of the move and sold the top. The, the, the theory of float rotation is that the, the buyers at 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, when we trade 30 million shares two days in a row, the buyers down here had ample time to get out at 8, 9, 10. How many buyers are actually buying at 3, holding on to their position and selling at 25, right? The, the, the theory of float rotation is that the, the buyers normally with that kind of volume and this kind of price increase, someone who held at 3, they're probably taking their gains at 6, 7, right? Or 5, right? And then the people who bought at 6 and 7 are taking their gains at 8 and 9. 
there's not this, you know, not everybody is holding on and everyone, you know, has to panic and sell all at one time because there's a float rotation. Everybody's getting churned, bought and sold as the stock's going up. So if there's no, you know, accumulation of buyers from the bottom, then there doesn't have to be this overwhelming selling pressure at say $8 a share or $9 a share. Just because it's up 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 percent, you know, the buyers and sellers are getting churned through and as we get to $12, we have new buyers and sellers. New buyers and sellers that are fresh at this level that, that aren't, you know, there's no hangover from the threes and fours buyers and sellers, right? So that's the idea of float rotation is that it gives everybody ample time to get out and everybody who's in the stock, it's likely that, you know, it's a likely assumption that a lot of the participants who are currently long or short the stock are fresh, right? And in small cap land, there, um, the, there's a second assumption that shorts like to to try to survive small cap moves to the upside because we all know that small cap companies are normally p pigs and that they're normally going to come down. That's the expectation is that crappy companies that get pumped up or go get up on hype and catalyst will eventually come down and every now and then we get a black swan runner where people hold that assumption a little too close to the heart and you know like Everybody thinks it has to come down, it has to come down, it has to come down. And so everybody keeps shorting and shorting and shorting and adding and adding and adding. And essentially, sometimes the entire float can be shorted and we just get an entire short squeeze like this. So this is kind of the explanation of these kinds of moves, right? And so anyway, so let's get into the trade that I did today on this. So right at the open, uh, let's go over the bad trade first. Uh, so this looks pretty drastic. I'm going to try to make it look as bad as possible. I sold the bottom, right? So in this situation, I was trying to, I bought this, I bought this, um, I had orders when the stock spiked up here. I had orders to buy at $9 a share and I, I didn't get the fill down here and then it popped up to 1050 and stuff. And, you know, I considered canceling my orders, but um, given how much volume this had traded, I, I had hoped that this could become a runner. I had hoped that, you know, that we would be able to recover from this stuff given that we're gapping up so high over yesterday. Probably still a whole bunch of people from yesterday who are holding overnight short probably still want to get out. And that this might, you know, people might think this that it's over down here, right? That it's that the stock is over after this stuff, but I was willing to give it another shot. And so I started scaling in here and because this is an anticipation play, right, I'm scaling in after a stuff, you know, I am going to try to save some face here and this is a half size loss. Um, because, and, and this is very consistent with my rule of staying half size on these kind of trades where the trade has, when you're anticipating, when you're buying into the weakness and the stock hasn't um, proven itself a winner yet, um, you can't go more than half in that because what's going to end up happening is you're go always if, if if you always have an add 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 to full strategy before the stock works for you. What's going to always end up happening is you're going to end you're going to always lose on full size, and you know you might win on full size sometimes, but a lot of your wins are going to be on half size. So what I was really hoping for was a reclaim of the 950s at this level and this would have been like my ad spot like in all of my other videos right so I took a pretty I took a pretty bad um, or bad looking loss here just because I got the bottom but um, the stock decided how do I zoom in on that let's the stock decided oops the stock decided to come back kind of like I thought and because I wasn't exhausted I was willing to give it a little bit more I was willing to give it one more chance. So we, this is a very strong perk and I posted in chat at about this time like, hey, this is a really strong perk off of the bottom, you know, off of this tank. And essentially, I'm willing to reuse the same idea, but instead of, tr as this trade, but instead of anticipating and trying to capture the bottom, now I just wait for the reclaim. I totally just wait for the reclaim. So I, I even say in chat, if this thing bursts through nine, I'm not going to be a buyer because this is a very possible stuff area, just like this was. 
you know, buying over 1050 here, just expecting it to break high of day. Well, buying over nine, expecting it to break and reclaim, you're kind of chasing into strength. So I told Chad I wasn't going to buy on this candle if it broke through nine. Right around here, I'm like, if this breaks through nine, I'm not going to be chasing it. But if it holds, I'm going to be interested. So fast forward a couple minutes and we start to hold. So I start to put on a feeler here, right? And like, I get the feeling that I'm going to be right right away. So I go ahead and I just and I, and I just put the rest and I double the size on this trade. And right as we perk through nine, I do like this higher low. And now that I have a fixed risk, I'm willing to go in as full size or as full as I want to, right? So I get to my full size position here and I immediately take off a third right here. I take off a third of my size right here for a scalp immediately. I'm a little bit red on the trade and I'm trying, you know, like, I'm trying to um, get back into my process and my process is to take a third off for a scalp. An argument could have been made that I should have taken off a third right here because this is a scalp and then this wouldn't have seemed so bad if I was able to get a piece off here. The, you know, in hindsight and in foresight too, I actually, I was talking to my tab and I was like, you know what? I totally should have taken that for a scalp because that's what I'm supposed to do. So if I could have done anything different on this trade, I should have taken a third off right here. You know, I still would have ended up losing on the trade, but, um, you know, just it would have been a little mitigated and this would have been a recycle. So um, fast forward, I take a third off here and we just keep going. I take another third off here and now I'm kind of hoping that we get a halt and we do. So I take a little piece, right? I take half of my third off for the halt. So I have like a sixth of my position off left. I have a, just a tiny about left and like... I let it I let it trade for the first minute. I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna sell if it gets under ten. I sold the last six down here, and of course then it just immediately ripped. And I don't regret that. You know, like I could have saved a little piece, but you know, I was happy to recover my day. It we were right here near high of day. I don't know at this point if it's going to be a back black swan. I don't wanna be betting for black swans on my trades. You know, like I need to create some kind of systematic approach to my trading that and if I try to gear my trading around capturing black swans, basically that's going to result in me losing over time. You know, if I if I don't take these profits, if I take this trade a thousand times and I don't take this profit here, just trying to get a black swan out of this one, I might make it on this one. But how many am I going to lose on? Right. And yes, I can make it the, the decisive factor maybe and decide that this trade has black swan potential. And that's what I tried to do with the last sixth. I just I just couldn't hold it. I was like, you know, if it gets under 10, this is a very, it's, it's halty, it's stuffy. This is where it stuffed hard last time. And I'm like, I'm, I only have a sixth in. I get out. And this is, oh, I thought that was the end of my trade, but I forgot. So anyway, it perks up. And after this big move now, after we, after we break high of day, I decide, you know, breaking high of day with authority like this, I can probably get a nice first bounce trade out of it. So I get a nice scalp out of this right here. You know, I, I, I just, I'm willing to, I was willing to add one more time on a crack under 1150. We didn't get it. So this is a smaller, just, you know, feeler size first bounce trade that I got. Buying here, selling, selling. I sold a little bit. I sold half right before high of day break. And I wanted to sell the rest on a new high of day break, but it looked like we were going to stuff. So I just sold the rest. So just a quick little scalp trade there to add padding to the day. But look, we, you know, we, we, we flash crash down here and go to higher. And so right now we're in black swan mode up here and, and black swans. Um, I normally say this is black swan and black swans are well above my pay grade. Right. And I just say that, and I'm not willing, and I'm not afraid to admit that Black swans are above my pay grade. I'm not looking to trade black swans. One, the spreads are always super shit. Black swans, two, the black swans always have an increased risk of T12 halt because we're up from $3 a share and we're already at 12. Not saying that it is going to, it's probably very unlikely that a T12 halt is, but I gear my trading towards avoiding that kind of situation at all costs. I don't want to be caught in a T12 halt long or short. So, I kind of just give give up on this for the rest of the day. Now, I considered buying it over here when we started to consolidate and like gear towards 14, um, right? Like right around here, I considered buying it up here, but I just didn't like the risk, you know? And like, yes, I know this is a black swan potential. It's already a, like a minor black swan at 14. Like it could become a major one like it did, but 
at this point, what am I risking? Not, you know, you can say that I can only risk thirteen dollars, but this is what's really tough about these kinds of trades. Um, I've already, I had already given up on the stock at this point. Like, I don't want to be like the spread's crappy. I don't want to be risking, you know, more than a dollar a share if anything bad happens. And I know I have to give it this much room. So, you know, am I willing to hold for twenty? You know, to, am I willing to risk like a a halt? a massive stuff candle to 12s where I don't get out until $12 and I risk $2 a share and then so in order to buy here at $14 I gotta hold out for 16 am I willing to estimate that no not at all so I just give up on it for the rest of the day and it just totally went nuts and so this is that float rotation that I was talking about it just doesn't let shorts out right and like you can see like when it, it really starts going parabolic here does this no dips like this is a little pullback, little pullback, but there's no like severe pullback. Even when it gets up here, this is a big pullback and it rips right back. You know, it pullback, rips right back. Like this kind of, this is a long, slow decay from 24 to 19 when we rip from 13 to 26 in equal amount of time. So this was real. this really just caught shorts in a bind and really, ha you know, when you short and cover the top, you're always tempted to chase down here but then you cover the top you chase down here you cover the top and it just ends up being an emotional mess and I just didn't want to be a part of it because I had you know I've lost on this kind of setup too many times so I gave up on it after my morning trades after the midday and the the perk I this was a well above my pay grade so um, one thing to take note one final thing to take note is a lot of people think that their trades are insignificant um, when they see hindsight results now this can be whether you bought it and sold it and then it went way higher or you shorted and covered and it went way lower. One good thing to take note that I think is important for uh, trader psychology is that your trade ends when you exit. You sh you're not supposed to give a flying fadoodle about what happens after you exit. Your trade, like you're otherwise, you're you're welcoming the chance for regret to happen. And when you open the door to regret, you're opening the door to FOMO. Next time, you're opening the door to makeup trades. You're opening the door to revenge trades. These are all things you want to avoid, right? These are all like detrimental trader um, downfalls. So, um, the the best rule of thumb is to not give a crap about what the stock does after your exit whether that's your stop or your target reached. Because you want to, at the end of the day, be cool with your decision. So, now, that, does this mean that you can't learn from opportunities and try to increase your profit for the next time? No, of course not. But what you shouldn't do is hang over on what you coulda, shoulda, woulda done. You know, your trade is over and next time you can plan for, um, you know, maybe perhaps better targets or better stops in mind for next time but what you can't do is dwell over the decisions you made this time your trade needs to end after for example I bought it here at 9 and I don't consider this a losing trade at all because it went to 26 and I only got this part and I was done with it here no I took the predictable part of the trade that that I was comfortable with that I know is the bread and butter part that I feel is the most predictable for me and I walked and I don't feel bad about what the stock does after because my trade ends at my target or my, my predetermined target or my predetermined stop. If my predetermined target or my predetermined stop needs work for next time, I will assess that you know at the end of the trading day or the next day or on the weekend. But I'm not going to dwell over it during the trading day or the next day even, like thinking about it before I've had time to refine my process. So separate the two. Process refinement time and trade ends. I'm I'm cool with it time. Anyway, that was the trade recap on SES. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Have a great have a great day or night. Aloha.